So I have to look techy today because we, the printer didn't work. So I have my notes on my iPad. <laughs> Isn't that kind of funny? I have to look very um, tech savvy. And the only challenge I get with this is that I have to keep moving them up like this so I can read them. But here we go. So today... We continue our Sweet Life series. Now, the kids are talking about Take 5. And Miss Maria, she gets the award for uh, the search and find with the candies. Because had anybody ever heard of a candy called Take 5? Oh, so I had never heard of it. So it's hard to find. It's not readily available. But she found enough for the kids today. Because we're dealing with the subject of, what would you guess? Take 5. Rest is good. That's not it, though. Anger. Stealing. <laughs> Take five. That's good, Leslie. Okay. <laughs> and, well, we're going to talk about anger and what God's word says about it. Okay. But before we do, are we ready with the video? Okay. We have a short video. Have you ever considered that, being held hostage by your most emotions? Let's just pray first. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, that there are so many truths contained in your word and that, God, it can bring healing and hope and just revelation to us. So I thank you, God, for this opportunity to share your word today. May it bear fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. So where does your anger lie today? See, sometimes it's not very evident right now in the moment, sitting at church, feeling pretty positive. Maybe that's not what you're thinking about. But then again, maybe something happened years ago, and you're still angry. Maybe somebody took advantage of you. They offended you, or they hurt you. And every now and then, you replay in your mind that event and how it happened. Maybe you're angry at your life. You look around and you say, this is not what I expected. This is not what I had planned. These are not the way that I expected my life to turn out and you become angry or you look at your job and you're not really happy about what you're seeing you're kind of angry at your boss because he takes advantage of you or you don't get paid what you think you deserve or maybe you look at your marriage and it's not what you had hoped for and if you're honest today there's some anger deep down inside maybe you're angry at yourself some of the decisions you made might not have been the best Maybe you got yourself into so much debt you can't dig yourself back out of it and you're feeling angry at yourself. Maybe you never finished college and you wish you had made different decisions and you made bad decisions and now you're just angry with yourself. Think about it. Maybe sometimes we're angry with God. Maybe we've prayed and prayed for an answer to a situation and God is yet to answer that and there's something in you that's angry with God, or for allowing something to happen in your life. Well, Ephesians 4.26, this is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, and the amazing thing is that he wrote this while he was still in prison, so if this guy had a reason to be angry, it would be Paul, unjustly imprisoned. And he says in verse 26, we're going to go over two verses, he says, in your anger... Do not sin, right? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now, anybody that's been married any length of time can understand that maybe in your marriage, when you first got marriage, married, you were like, this is like Pollyannaville, right? Yay! We're always going to get along, and we're never going to fight. It's going to be great, always. Yeah. So as you know, we just celebrated 25 years, and I probably started exactly that way. But I'll tell you, there were many times where we stayed up all night, right? Because God God say, do not let the sun go down on your anger. And so if you ever try to go to bed angry, what does that look like? You know, there's so much wisdom in what Paul says. I can remember those nights where I couldn't sleep because there was so much anger because of the words that we had shared. And the only way that you can truly let it go is to begin to work it out. Well, he goes on to say in verse 27, and I don't want you to miss this part because this is what anger does. It says, and do not give the devil a foothold. 
Do not give the devil a foothold. Now, if you think about that, that is just a way to kind of get into your life and begin to take over. And so we don't want to let anger give the devil a foothold. Now, we talked about this story. What the kids are talking about today is Cain and Abel and how anger had gotten a hold of Cain. The two brothers, right? The boys of Adam and Eve, and they had this thing about their offering and how God liked one and didn't like the other. Now, we talked a little bit about this before back in my message in April called First Blood, so I won't go into that part. But there was this anger, and God says to Cain, he says, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Right? Because of this offering and this whole issue. And then it goes on to this. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. See, that, that, that relationship between anger and sin has begun in the first part of the story of our creation. That sin has a way, or anger has a way of causing us to sin. Now, I'm going to say this a few times over just to make sure you get it. Anger is not sin. Anger is not sin. In the same way that temptation is not sin, temptation causes us to sin. Anger can cause us to sin. But what does the word say right here? It says, you must rule over it. In other translations, it says, master it. So what do we have to do? We have to master it, rule over it, all right? So anger. Well, there's two ways that I have found that some people handle anger. And neither one of these are the ideals. They are the spewers and the stewers. Does that make sense? We have the spewers and we have the stewers. So now, spewers. I've always been a spewer. Shocking, I'm sure. You're thinking, no, you couldn't possibly be somebody like that. Well, who's a spewer? Well, we probably know exactly who the spewers are in our own, at least our intimate environments, right? Because we hear you. <laughs> you are the ones that get it off your chest, right? You let everything out in the open. You send emails in response to things, but not just any email. Chances are they're in caps lock, right? Or your texts are in caps lock because you're making a point, right? You send text messages. You leave the message on the answering machine saying exactly what you're thinking. And once you get it out, you feel better, right? I've spewed it. I feel better. Everything is good. Now, on the other hand, we have the spewers. On the other hand, we have the stewers. Now, if you're a stewer, you're a little bit harder to find, right? Because it's not so outward. But you're still just as dangerous. Why? Because you keep everything inside everything inside as it builds and it builds and it stirs inside of you and creates this kind of anger stew inside as you just keep everything inside. It's like water that's about to boil and, and outside everything looks fine. The smile is good and everything's fine. And, but honestly, you're probably ready to put cyanide in somebody's coffee because of the anger that's going on inside. But everything from up here is good. Spewers and stewards. But let me tell you what the Bible says about those two. Oh, hey, Cam, are you still there? Could you put up my little friend? Thank you. There it is. <laughs> I just want you to get a sense of what anger can look like. Okay. Does anybody know who that is? Does he normally look like that? No, he normally looks good until everything gets a hold of him, right? He's both a spewer and a stewer. So the Bible says about the spewers, right? Repeat after me. Spewers express it. Spewers express it. So, but Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. All right? A fool gives Full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. So what does the Bible call those of us that are spewers? Okay, right. I did not say that. Please do not get angry with me. So spewers 
are a fool because they don't know how to control. But a wise man, right, what does a wise man do? Quietly holds it back. So maybe today you're thinking, I never lose my temper. I, don't, I couldn't actually hit somebody. I never look like that where it all just comes out of me physically. But maybe you're the kind of person that spews and hits with the fist of your words. You've said unthinkable things like, I wish I'd never married you, or I wish you'd never been born, or even some subtler things. What do you do with your day? What are you doing all day? And how come dinner's not ready? Or you'll never amount to anything. See, words are powerful. There's life and death in the tongue, the Bible says, right? Spewers express it. And when they do, they normally leave a trail of destruction in their path. But what about stewards? Okay, if you're a steward, and maybe you're taking notes. Anybody using their paper to take notes today? Stewards suppress it. Say, stewards suppress it. All right, so our spewers express it, our stewers suppress it. But Psalm 32, 3 says this, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. My bones wasted away. So all of that stuff inside is eating us from the inside out. Amen? The suppression of anger. And back in Father's Day, we talked about the prodigal son, right? The story of the prodigal son, this guy took his inheritance, took off, went off, and kind of spent it in the Middle Eastern version of Vegas, repented, came home. We hear all about the prodigal son and the love for the father, for the son, but then there's the other guy. What about the older son who didn't do that and stayed at home? In Luke 15, this is what it says about the brother, but he was angry and refused to go in, right? There's all this whole party, and the brother just decides to get angry and not go in. So the older brother is stewing, right? He's getting really angry. He doesn't think he's doing any damage, but stewers basically emotionally shut yourselves down. You put up a wall to those who love you and care about you, and it's just as destructive because you don't let anybody in. You hide it, and you keep it inside, and you don't talk about it. You don't communicate it, and worse, this thing called anger eats you alive. I want to read that psalm again. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. And so these are two unhealthy ways of expressing our anger. We need to learn how to do other things. And so I want to give you two ways to talk about it. Because remember I said anger is not sin, right? It says in the verse, in your anger, do not sin. All right? So the, the assumption is that you will have anger at some point. And we have to figure out the good anger and the bad anger. Because if anger is an emotion that God has given us, can it be used for good? Yes. All right? Can it be used for bad? Yes. We've seen that often and uh, too often in our world today. So there's sinful anger, and there's sanctified anger. Sinful anger and sanctified anger. Sanctified anger is something that angers the heart of God. And I'll talk more about that a little bit. But if it's sinful anger, what are we going to do? This is what we're going to do. We're going to put it out. Say, put it out. Put it out. (laughs) Proverbs 17, 14 says this. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. I'll read it again. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. What does it mean to breach a dam? Right? It's holding. Think about, have you ever um, done some of the tours, like if you go how they built um, uh, some of the dams around here, like the Clinton Dam or uh, the Quabbin? Have you seen the height of those walls that they had to build to create these reservoirs? It is massive. And we don't see it anymore because the water is in front of it. But if you do any of the, um, uh, the historical things and go see the pictures of how they built the Quabbin and that, these, these walls are 
unbelievable, like frighteningly huge. And then you see the houses that used to exist before they kind of let the water fill back in. And it's just, and these people lived while they were building it. I'm sure it was frightening beyond all reason. So if you think about a dam that size and the amount of water that it's holding it back, sometimes that's us in our anger. We've built these walls and we have these huge things and it's just waiting for, right? Am I the only one that that's ever happened to where everything is good and then ever hear this, the, 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 the phrase, um, that's the last straw or the straw that broke the camel's back. Why? Because that's something that everybody kind of can understand, that sometimes you're going along and it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds and then you breach the dam and everything <laughs> comes out, right? So we have to figure out how not to breach our dam. So we're going to put it out. Say it again. All right. So I remember back, um, this is a couple years ago, actually quite a few years ago, but I was, I wanted to talk about like road rage. Has anybody ever experienced road rage? <laughs> no, nobody has. Well, let me tell you my story. So I was traveling in the left-hand lane, and I was passing people, right? So it's okay to be in the left-hand lane while you're passing people. Well, there was a person that <laughs> didn't think I was going quite fast enough, and they came so close to the back of my car that I thought they were going to hit me. So in my wisdom, now this was a, a few years ago, in my wisdom, I pumped the brakes. And he came really, really close to my car. And then, because then I slowed down because I was making a point. Genius, right? So then I eventually, as I passed these cars, I pulled over to the right. Well, this gentleman decided that he was going to pull in front of me and slam on his brakes. And this went on for a while. You know what I had to do? I had to take the exit. Okay? This was going nowhere good fast. <laughs> So that's just an example of how we can get in a situation where our anger can get the best of us, right? I could have, we could have gone on for miles torturing each other because of this one event in the left-hand lane. So take the exit. Say, take the exit. So what about you? <laughs> Maybe you need to take the exit. And let me give you some examples. Maybe it's you. And you're driving around and you have your kids in the back seat and they're freaking out and they're throwing things and they're arguing. Maybe it's time to just pull over, take a breath, <laughs> talk, take the exit. Say, take the exit. Maybe you get angry when you're tired. Maybe you're one of those people. And so at the end of the day, you're so irritable and you get frustrated at everything and everything just ticks you off, right? What should you do? Maybe you should go to bed. Yeah, go to bed early, let's say. So that's take the exit. Say, take the exit. Maybe there's a coworker, and he's like all those people that you watch. Have you ever watched The Office? They're so annoying, and everything about them is driving you crazy. What do you do? Do you avoid them? Do you confront them? Maybe you just have a reasonable conversation, and you take the exit. They take the exit. All right. Maybe you've had arguments with your spouse about finances or something fun like that. That's always a good one to have, right? And you just can't come to an agreement and there's all this emotion and anger and this stalemate that's going on. What do you do? Make a plan. Sit down. Calm down. Take the exit. Take the exit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Maybe you're angry at yourself. You're frustrated with yourself, and uh, uh, <laughs> you, need, you, you know that you've made some really bad decisions, and you struggle with the fact that God's grace is actually enough for you. And you feel this anger about yourself rising up. And you feel it. You know it's sinful anger. It's going to cause you to do something that you're going to regret. What do you do? Put it out. Say, so take the exit. Take the exit and deal with it. And I know some of you are probably saying, hey, Pastor Davey, it's really not that easy, is it? Have anybody here 
ever gotten in a fight on the way to church? No, right? Nobody's ever done that. Well, okay, for those of us that have, because I'm going to put myself in that, because I know that I have, although I tend to come by myself now, but before when we were serving in places that we drove all together as a family, there would inevitably be some of those Sundays where it was like, blah, 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 and then you walk through the door, glory, everybody would never know, right? Because, hey now, anger's a choice, Right? Say, anger's a choice. Anger's a choice. Love is a choice. You know, we went through, um, when we were having dinner on our 25th anniversary, the woman that was our waitress said to me, what advice would you give me? I'm just starting this journey. You know, 25 years, what advice would you give me? And my advice was this, love is a choice. Love is a choice because it's not always easy. We are going to come up against things. And so the uh, love and anger, anger is a choice. We will have situations that will raise your Irish, okay? I'm Scotch-Irish. Can you tell by my skin tone? So am I normally a calm? Mary's going, yes and amen. Do you know what it's like to be born with this gene pool? Yes. And so you tend to be... Larger than life sometimes. It's like the, you know, on the other side of Italian. So you, anger is a choice. The way you respond to the feelings of anger is a choice. So if you can make yourself walk into church, put the smile on, take an hour and a half to forget about the argument, then you can choose to do that in any situation, even if you're still in the room with those people, because you can choose to change the trajectory of your relationship in that moment. Anger is a choice. You can master it. It's crouching at your door, but you must master it. Is it an option? No. <laughs> All right, so what do we do then with this sanctified anger? All right, so this is the end here. Wrapping up the message. If you're taking notes, I keep looking for the pens. Taking notes, if it's sanctified anger, what are we going to do? We're going to fan the flame. Say, fan the flame. Fan the flame. We have sinful anger. We're going to put it out. Take the exit. Pick your phrase. Sanctified anger. We're going to fan the flame. So I want to think, the, like I said, it's the things that anger the heart of God. All right? What angers you? Well, maybe it's poverty. Maybe the things about poverty really drive you nuts. Did you know there's one in seven people in this world that go to bed hungry every night? One in seven people don't even have clean, clean water. So maybe poverty angers you like it angers the heart of God. Maybe it's um, disease, right? 38 million people that have AIDS. Maybe you're angry with all these kids that have preventable diseases. Maybe you're uh, angered by the drug epidemic that we have and, and how it seems like it's taking so many so young. What is it that gives you a sanctified anger? Because even Jesus had sanctified anger. He went to the church and he was going to heal on the Sabbath. I should say the temple because the church didn't exist. The temple. And he wanted to heal this guy, but the religious leaders wanted to stop him. Why? Because it was the Sabbath and he wasn't supposed to heal. And, and so Jesus, it says in Mark 3, he looked around at them in anger. And his response should tell us what to do, to do something about what you're feeling. Do something with this sanctified anger. And he says he stretched out his hand and it was restored. So Jesus uses anger to do something beautiful. So I want to ask you what your sanctified anger is and let that drive you to do something, to motivate you, to, to make a difference, to do something truly beautiful. Because as Christ followers, there's a lot of things in this life that can really anger God's heart. And therefore, they should anger ours. They should disturb us. They should give us a holy discontent. If you don't be comfortable with the word anger, a holy discontent where things are not right and you want to be an agent of change. Sanctified anger. There's a lot of things in this life that could stand for the people of God to raise up, 
to fan into flame this anger, this sanctified anger, and to do something beautiful. So before we close, I want to pray for you guys. I want to pray for those uh, that might be a, a Christian right now, and maybe you have a sanctified anger. Maybe there's something that you're thinking about right now that you're saying, I want to make a difference. There's something that's always been stirring in me that now I'm realizing that God wants to bring to fruition. There's something in me that I have felt this righteous anger, this sanctified anger. I want to be an agent of change. Or maybe you're thinking, I don't really have anything that's weighing on my heart this morning. Maybe there's, like you're saying, I really can't think of something. Is there anybody here that says, yes, I have this sanctified anger about something, or I want something like that. Amen. Let's just pray for you guys right now. God, I pray for those who boldly raise their hand this morning. Hallelujah. God, I pray you would help them, that you would equip them, God. Anoint them, God, to fan this flame of that sanctified anger. And if they don't even have one, God, I pray, God, that right now you would give them one that would almost keep them up at night restless in order to do something beautiful in your name. I pray, God, that you would continue to motivate them and drive them with this strong desire, God, to make a difference in people's lives and to do something beautiful just like Jesus did. Hallelujah, God. And I would continue to pray, God, if there's anyone in this room, God, that, that, that there's a good news. There's good news, and you guys can look up for a moment. There is a time and a place where we understand that we, either, we are followers of Christ, and we know that we know that we know. And maybe you're wondering that I, I've had anger all my life, and these are the things that I've been struggling with, and maybe I still have anger issues. You know, that was, I've told you before, that was my thing. Man, I was angry. That video of that guy, it was me. I had so much anger for so many years of all the brokenness and all of the things that happened to me, and it just built up and built up and built up until my husband wouldn't marry me until I did something about it. I was unhealthy. I had anger. I would try to hurt myself because I was so angry, and I didn't know what to do with it. And maybe that's you, because I'll tell you, God can heal it. God can remove it. God can do a miracle. Hallelujah in an angry heart. Just like that gentleman in the video, and just like he did in my life, he removed it. Praise God. Ugh. It was exhausting to be so angry all the time. And I'm not joking. All the time. Every response I had was one in anger. And so maybe that's you. Maybe you're really struggling with anger this morning. So with every head bowed. I'm going to let God speak to you this morning. And if anybody here is truly struggling with anger, and they would like some prayer right now, I'm not going to point anybody out, I'm not going to call any names, but if that is you, give me the chance to pray over you this morning. Would you raise your hand if you're struggling with any anger at all? Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Well, let's just pray right now. Let's just go to the throne room of grace. Thank you, God, for those that have raised their hands, God. I know that this is something that is universally true for so many people, God, that because we live in a broken world and because things have happened sometimes by our own choosing and sometimes not by our choosing, God, that we have these anger, this built up inside of us. Sometimes it just stays hidden in our hearts, encrusted by years and years of buildup. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that even now in this moment, God, that you would begin to tear down that slowly, ever so gently, the way that you do, and bring those dark places into the light, God, so that you can bring healing into the hearts of men and women in this place, God, that struggle with anger. And God, we know that Anger is not the sin, but God, I know that it can bear sinful fruit if it's not dealt with. And so God, in this moment, Lord, we surrender it to you. For everyone that raised their hand in this place, God, I pray, God, that you continue to minister healing 
and wholeness in their hearts, God, and they, they would surrender this anger to you. And I know, God, sometimes it's a process, so God, we enter into a process of healing and wholeness as you continue to reveal those things. Sometimes, God, we are not ready to see it all at once, but God, that you would begin to so gently reveal those places that need your healing and your hope so that we can live with a joy unspeakable and not operate in a spirit of anger, God. I pray, God, for everyone in this place, Lord, that we would understand how much you truly love us and that, God, there is no judgment here on anybody that struggles with anger, that, God, we are your children, you have called us your own, and you are here to help walk us by the power of your Holy Spirit into a a place of joy and victory over anger. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. I thank you, Lord, that my life is a testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit to heal and make me whole. And so, God, I pray that for everyone in this place. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. God can do it. Amen. Do you believe it?